and you can start whenever you like, Michael. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kim. Sure. It's nice to see you guys again this week. I hope that you all had nice weekends and your week's been off to a good start. So I was hoping um, that we could spend the next hour and 20 minutes, I guess, um, spending some time talking about ethics and technologies. Um, so taking a little bit of a, a different focus than the last time that uh, we met on Thursday. And these are the questions I just like to, to raise to have people just start to think on this topic. Um, I'm hoping that all these questions align very appropriately with the theme of this course. So I'll read yeah. them out to you. What role do technologies have in our lives? What is a technology? I guess that should have been the first question. How do we evaluate technologies? So what makes a good technology compared to a bad technology? What properties must a technology have if it is to be an object of moral concern? meaning if I am to have obligations with respect to it, where I have to treat it in, in some way, which is fair or good. What kind of technological world do we want to live in? Do machines have the capacity for moral consciousness? And recognizing that as human humans, we are technological beings, what kind of humans do we want to become? This is my slide that I'll bring up a few times during the presentation. And these are what I'm hoping are the, the take home points. Okay. So I just like you to begin by looking around you, uh, whether it's in the room that you're currently in, whether you're looking at the screen in front of you. And I'd like you to ask, what around you is natural? What around you is not touched by technology, if anything in that regard? And I'm looking for some conversation here. So whether you wanna type into the chat box or whether you wanna unmute your microphone. Yeah, <clears throat> there's like literally nothing around me that's untouched by technology. Like, I guess even the apple that I ate, it was made by many generations of like breeding and stuff. And that involved technology, so. Thanks, Chen. Uh, Sean Liss? Yeah, so we actually had this discussion in a cultural studies course that I took a couple of years ago. And what we found was the idea of what is natural versus what is artificial is largely an arbitrary construction. To say that something is natural because humans made it is a little bit strange because humans are a part of nature. Whether we like it or not, we can't escape nature. Thanks, Sean. Do you think the same is true for so-called things that are made by animals and other non-human organic beings? Um, we actually talked about uh, like beehives as an example. We consider those to be natural constructs, yet they are constructed by animals. Thanks, Sean. I wish I could have been in that course. It's, it's nice to hear how people from different disciplines and different backgrounds approach similar questions. Other thoughts that people had in the room. Does anyone want to disagree with either Chan or present a different perspective than Sean? So I just wanted to point out that we've never had seven TAs in the course before. And the consequence of that is we are um, really uh, celebrating diversity of opinion and different, <laughs> different vantage points. And, and, and we ha happen to have uh, an extra TA in the room today. Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> okay. Um, 
can't really see me on the screen. Well, no, no, we, we can. Yeah, there. Oh, hi. Um, so it's Nadia. I remember this particular lecture from last year. And I remember, you know, holding up my cat and thinking, okay, my cat is definitely natural. But like, at the same time, he's very conditioned by his surroundings, be it, I guess, and after what Sean said about the distinction of nature versus technology being arbitrary. Um, like technology, I guess, becomes nature in the sense that we consider nature to be something that just surrounds us and we don't particularly notice it. And so in a way, technology can become nature if we just get so used to it. So mm -hmm. I guess that's my, that's my two cents. <laughs> It's funny, um, so a lot of the work I do is coming out of the social sciences, and there's almost a reverence there for ideas such as compassion, trust, uh, reciprocity, um, and other kind of moral constructs. And for many people, they say, well, these are what make us uniquely human. Um, but on the other hand, you know, how we encounter other people, whether it's through a Zoom class, whether it's through an, an iPhone, whether it's through email or old fashioned, you know, snail mail, all of that affects the way that we relate to one another and can shape the nature of constructs like compassion and trust and reciprocity. I, I saw Matthew, I think you put up your hand really briefly and then you raised it, lowered it, your technological. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I, uh, my point kind of was that, um, you know, even if we look at a cat, you know, we could say that it's been selectively bred and that's kind of a, a, a process kind of linked to technology and science. And so, but I mean, even in our own biological, like we would say our natural systems, I mean, we still have our own breeding patterns, but those we define as natural, whereas Input, human input into a, a different species is kind of is seen as unnatural technically. So, I mean, I guess it was, I guess that was kind of my thought. So, um, whether a cat is untouched by technology, I, I couldn't say, but that's what I was kind of thinking. Thanks. So, in our household, there's my wife and me and the cat, and there's no question that the cat is in charge. Really, the, the focus of activities is, is the cat. And, and there are many technology things that the cat responds to or is, is influenced by. So, yeah. yeah. So as someone who's in the, in the health sciences, uh, as a physician, um, you know, issues related to philosophy of technology are very much at the forefront of clinical practice. Because um, it would be very easy for us to shape any of these cardinal questions of philosophy of technology uh, to the clinical sphere. So we can ask, what role do things play in our technological culture? Um, so in the context of a newborn intensive care unit, we can ask how do the different machines and other devices used for monitoring patients, supporting their heart or their lungs, not only how do they afford a, a child health or recovery from illness, but how do they also shape the interactions um, at the bedside? There's a question though also in philosophy of technology of should we assign agency or responsibility to technologies themselves? Meaning to what extent can we talk about a technology as good or bad independent of the user of it? meaning do technologies in and of themselves bear morality? What effects do things have on us? So how do things in a McLuhan way massage our sensibilities, right? How do they shape our very consciousness? And if we fundamentally recognize that as human beings, we are fundamentally touched by technology, that as human beings, we are designers of technology, and technologies can also be realized as constituting our very humanity. Any thoughts on any of these questions? These are really, for me, like the core questions that just uh, define or 
a philosophy of technology and circles around. Oh, I see an arm up. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, this is Tasmin. So kind of going back to the last slide of questions, asking what is natural and what is untouched by technology, those are kind of two different questions to me. Um, because what we consider natural is what is part of our everyday life, right? So technology, different certain types of technology are very natural to like modern lifestyle. So then when we come to the, these questions of um, what role technology plays in our culture and how do we assign agency or responsibility, um, there's this notion of like even playing fields and everybody having the same opportunity. And that opportunity has a lot to do with um, equal access to technologies that are not considered natural in terms of like nature that we were talking about before, but are considered natural in what is common and ubiquitous in modern life. And just, yeah, that kind of line of thinking. It reminds me um, what you're describing is, is almost this forgetfulness that we have of technologies, that as a technology becomes adapted and becomes part of human life, we tend to pass over it because it loses its newness, it loses its novelty, um, and it, it becomes forgotten as, in its presence, despite it very much being part of, of human life, right? And that's when we often think of the everyday technologies that people don't tend to think of as a technology, but nonetheless are technologies. So a, a good example of that would be human language can be regarded as a technology, right? Human writing can be acknowledged as a technology, but we don't tend to think of them as such because they've been ingrained into culture. Um, when I kind of started getting interested in philosophy, philosophy of technology studies, um, I found this distinction very helpful. Um, I recognize everyone in this classroom comes from different backgrounds. Some have probably read a lot of this literature already. Others might be neophytes to it. Um, people who write on the history of philosophy of technology often make uh, distinctions of three different phases of thought. The first phase is what's known as an instrumental perspective of technology. And I think it's true to very much say that many people still regard technologies in only an instrumental way. So an instrumental perspective of technology would, review, would view a technology in and of itself as neutral. And how we regard its effect on our actions is really nothing more than a tool. So a prime example of an instrumental view of technology would be someone uttering the phrase, um, guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? So it, uh, the consequence or the outcome of an action I might undertake while using the gun um, is, is a consequence of my actions. It has nothing to do with how the technology is designed. The technology is only instrumental in its effect. From an instrumental per perspective of technology um, emerged singular transcendental perspectives of technologies. And this is often aligned or recognized in the work of um, like people like uh, Martin Heidegger, for example. And this is when uh, philosophers begin to take more of a critical uh, role to techno critical viewpoint towards technology to actually say that technologies are more than their instrumental effects technologies inadvertently shape the way that we're around each other, often in untoward ways. Now, a singular transcendental perspective would often view technologies as all one and the same, meaning that we can talk about technology with a capital T as being a bad thing or a good thing. Technology is gonna save us or technology is gonna be our doom, rather than focusing on the uniqueness and distinctions of particular technologies, which is the empirical term. And that's where I think most contemporary philosophers of technologies are now. And that's regarding that, you know, the technology of an iPhone is very distinct compared to say the technology of, you know, air conditioning or the technology of other screen devices. Each, each of them structure our experience of the world in different ways. 
um, each of those technologies have different um, affordances uh, and diff pose different opportunities for human interactions. Are those distinctions clear to people? Um, a lot of the empirical research I do uh, is qualitative and it fits under the banner of phenomenology. Uh, phenomenology is essentially uh, the study of human experience, uh, recognizing that um, there are different ways of understanding what human experience consists of. One way of articulating or understanding the um, study of human experience is to understand the study of human consciousness. And by consciousness, I don't mean self-consciousness, but rather the manner in which we directly experience the world in our day-to-day -day actions within the world. And phenomenology generally regards how we experience the world is one which is pre-reflective. What does that mean? That means when I'm acting within the world, when I'm conducting myself within the world, I tend not to think of my experiencing of the world, but rather I'm just experiencing it. So to give an example, if I'm driving my car to work, I don't generally think of the experience of driving a car, of what it's like to experience driving a car. Rather, I'm simply drive a car. I'm engaged in activities without reflecting on them. And that's experiencing of the world is formative of my consciousness. Post-phenomenology is a movement within philosophy of technology, as well as a movement within uh, phenomenology, which essentially regards all technologies as structuring or mediating of my consciousness of the world. So um, a technical term within phenomenology is the notion of intentionality, which can be understood as the directedness of my consciousness. And basically, um, post-phenomenology will regard that an intentionality is always a technological intentionality. And therefore, the aim of post-phenomenology is to understand the unique ways that different technologies structure my experiencing of the world or mediate my experiencing of the world. So here the focus is not on the technology, it's not on human subjectivity, it's rather on how does that technological mediation unfold. Is that making sense to people? Every now and then I'm scanning this little box showing people's foreheads and eyes and seeing if I can see nods or people shaking their head or people lost in space. So this is an image from, um, from where I work um, in the NICU. And you can see these two parents who are reaching in to touch their child. They're probably not aware in that moment just how all the different technologies around them are structuring their experience of the child, right? How even the neonatal isolate or incubator uh, affords a particular way of coming in contact with your child. Now, one can reflect on how is it that these different technologies affect my experiencing of the world, um, but the point is that we tend not to do that. So if we want to better understand technologies, uh, we can reflect on them. Uh, Don Eide, uh, an American philosopher, is generally regarded as um, one of the major figures within post-phenomenology. Uh, he's the one who coined the term uh, he's had numerous students that have followed him. He's written numerous texts on, on technologies. Uh, probably one of his most important contemporary students is uh, Peter Paul Verbeek, um, who's written some really nice books about morality and technology. Um, the original technological relations that Don Eide described were embodiment relations, hermeneutic relations, alterity relations, and background relations. And essentially what he was trying to show is that um, we can begin to think of different technologies as having unique ways that structure our consciousness of the world. But on the other hand, they're also shared between different technologies. So 
something like uh, a hammer, for example, uh, I embody that technology. So when I pick up a hammer and I'm actually using it, I no longer am thinking about the hammer in my hand, but rather my way of interacting with the world becomes one in which it is tool-like and becomes part of my body in the same way that um, I embody other technologies, um, you know, other tools, things like a cane, even a car I can embody, right? And, you know, we know that in the sense of if you're driving a car and, you know, you're truly not reflecting on that experience of driving a car and someone so suddenly comes out of a lane ahead of you and, you know, comes really close to your own car, you almost have that sense someone's about to hit you. It's not that they're going to hit your car, they're going to hit you because you're embodying the car in and of itself. And then there are other technologies that we have a hermeneutic relation to. Um, so uh, hermeneutic relation is a technology that represents the world to us. So an example would be a thermometer, right? Um, various digital technologies. Essentially, they represent the world and we essentially read the world through the technology. So that's a very different relation than what a technology that we embody compared to technologies for which we have an alterity relation with. This is a technology that we encounter as an other to ourselves. You know, an example of this would be, you know, Siri on your iPhone, right? Where you can pick up your phone and say, oh, stupid Siri, she can't understand my accent, right? And we throw it down on the floor. We're encountering that technology in a different way to a tool or a hermeneutic. And then there are those other technologies that are in the background, right? That we don't think about, but they somehow condition our environment. Um, so an example would be uh, something like, you know, modern lighting or air conditioning, right? Or uh, insulation or something like that. It changes the nature of our world. Now, there are other relations that have been articulated by other um, people within this sphere. Um, but I, my point in presenting these four was mainly to introduce you to this particular way of thinking about technologies. And that's just some of the examples. So in clinical practice, we can think of the most mundane of technologies like a stethoscope, right? Which we may embody. But on the other hand, it also may present as a hermeneutic, right? as it represents the child a particular way of hearing. So technologies are not just necessarily operating in one form of relation. There's a chest x-ray showing you an example of a hermeneutic relation, you know, technologies in the background, right? Although it could also be encountered as another as well. So, I introduced post-phenomenology and, and that initial question that I, I recognize some of you have discussed before, really to try and bring home that point that technologies are constitutive of our very being in the world. It's very hard to imagine a world, the world that we currently live in, without technologies, right? And they are so close to, um, they are so near to our experience end of the world one can make the argument that actually they are what makes us human. And we'll go more into that in a second. So any questions about that first point? Okay. So I talked to you last class about different kinds of ethical questions and I introduced them around that case of trisomy 18 or a child with trisomy 18, that's a better way of saying it. We can also talk about what are technological ethical questions. So um, one way that I think of this would be uh, how does a technology weave into human life affecting our perception, actions, and decisions? And if ethics is fundamentally about otherness or how we respond to others in our world, then we could also say the fundamental technological ethical question is how is it that technologies shape our experiences of those who are other than ourselves? Okay, so I did show this last year, but I just love this little clip so much and it gives me a nice 10 minute break from talking. Um, so I'm just gonna play a little video 
Um, any questions before I press play? Un jour, Zeus a dit à Prométhée, « Le temps est venu pour toi, pour nous les dieux, de faire venir au jour les non-immortels. » Les non-immortels, ce sont les animaux, les hommes. Or, Prométhée, qui est chargé de faire ce travail, a un frère. Ce frère et son jumeau, il s'appelle Épiméthée. Ce frère Épiméthée, il a pour caractéristique d'être le jumeau, le frère jumeau de Prométhée. Il lui ressemble, il est tout à fait son double, mais il est de son contraire également. Épiméthée, c'est le dieu du défaut, de l'oubli. Prométhée, c'est celui du savoir, de la maîtrise absolue, de la mémoire totale. Prométhée n'oublie rien. Épiméthée oublie tout. Or, Épiméthée dit à son frère Prométhée, « Zeus t'a chargé de faire quelque chose, je veux m'en occuper. C'est moi, c'est moi, c'est moi qui m'en occupe. » Et comme euh, Épiméthée, c'est le frère un peu simple d'esprit de Prométhée, Prométhée a de l'affection pour son frère. Il n'ose pas refuser. Il dit « D'accord, je t'en occupe. » Donc, Épiméthée va se mettre à distribuer les qualités. Il va donner, par exemple, à la gazelle la vitesse, la gazelle coffrette. Au lion, la force et l'endurance. À la tortue, la carapace, etc., etc. Bref, il va distribuer des qualités qui sont équilibrées. Ce que décrit la distribution des qualités par Épiméthée, c'est l'équilibre écologique de la nature. Le lion court après la gazelle, il mange la gazelle, mais comme les gazelles courent très vite, il y a toujours des gazelles qui se reproduisent, que le lion n'attrape pas, et tout ça, tout va bien. Toutes les espèces sont équilibrées. Donc, Épiméthée distribue toutes les qualités, et puis d'un seul coup, il s'aperçoit qu'il regarde dans son panier, il n'y a plus de qualité. J'ai oublié de garder une qualité pour moi. Le panier est vide. Or, il me reste à, créer, à, à faire venir au jour, comme dit le nain, l'homme, enfin le mortel. Il y avait encore une espèce à faire venir au jour, mais il n'y a plus de qualité pour lui donner une forme. Du coup, Prométhée est obligé d'aller dans l'Olympe, dans l'atelier des Phaïstos, voler le feu. Le feu qui est évidemment le symbole de la technique, mais qui est aussi le symbole de la puissance de Dieu, Zeus. Pourquoi me suis-je donc tourné vers Prométhée et Épiméthée En disant, si nous voulons comprendre la question de la technique telle qu'elle se pose à nous aujourd'hui, les hommes du XXIe siècle, nous devons nous retourner vers la mythologie des Grecs anciens pas simplement la philosophie, mais la mythologie tragique. Les Grecs anciens, si j'ai dû dire cela, c'est parce que cette mythologie des Grecs anciens pose précisément correctement le problème. Dans les termes de la mythologie, bien sûr, et de la religion grecque primitive, de la religion tragique des Grecs, mais il pose incroyablement la question comme elle doit être posée.
Donc, Prométhée va voler le feu, c'est-à-dire la technique, c'est-à-dire aussi l'intelligence d'Athéna. Et l'homme va être un être vivant, mortel, qui va être condamné à se fabriquer ses prothèses, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'a pas de qualité. Il est sans cesse dans l'obligation de se doter de nouveaux artifices pour survivre, et surtout, étant donné qu'il n'a pas une qualité définie à l'avance, eh bien, les hommes entre eux entrent en conflit les uns avec les autres pour dire quelle est leur qualité, quel est leur avenir. Les uns disent il faut faire ceci, les autres disent non, non, il faut faire cela. L'animal, le zèbre, la gazelle dont je parlais tout à l'heure, la vache ou le lion, ils n'ont pas de questions à se poser sur qui sommes-nous. Who are we? C'est pas quoi je trouve un aliment. Mais pour l'homme, c'est une question éternelle. Qui sommes-nous Est-ce que nous devons développer des computers Est-ce que nous devons aller sur la Lune Est-ce que nous devons euh, raser cette forêt Construire ce barrage sur le fleuve de Hölderlin Est-ce que nous devons faire ça La technique, c'est la question. Dès que je suis technique, je suis en train de questionner. C'est la raison pour laquelle, d'ailleurs, Zeus va devoir envoyer Hermès. Zeus va devoir envoyer Hermès. Parce que les hommes vont se faire la guerre entre eux. Ils se posent des questions, ils n'arrivent pas à se mettre d'accord sur les réponses à ces questions. Donc ils se massacrent. C'est la fameuse guerre civile qui fait tellement peur aux Grecs ce que les Grecs appellent la stasis. Et c'est un fait historique. Les Grecs, à l'époque où Platon raconte ce mythe à travers la bouche de Pratagoras, eh bien, la Grèce vit la guerre, les guerres du Péloponnèse, c'est-à-dire la guerre entre tous les Grecs. Je vous disais tout à l'heure que l'homme est un être qui adopte des techniques nouvelles, des noms nouveaux, des idées nouvelles, sans cesse des œuvres d'art nouvelles. L'adoption, c'est la guerre. La possibilité de l'adoption, c'est le risque de la guerre. Sans cesse. Protagoras raconte que Zeus va envoyer Hermès, c'est-à-dire le savoir de Dickey, la justice, pour éviter que les hommes s'entretuent et s'anéantissent eux-mêmes. Mais pour que la diquet soit devenue nécessaire, il faut d'abord qu'il y ait la technique. La technique qui est à la fois la prothèse, l'artifice qui permet aux hommes de survivre face aux prédateurs, c'est ce que raconte le mythe de Prométhée et d'Épiméthée. Mais la technique est aussi le support de la mémoire, comme je vous le disais tout à l'heure. Le support du livre, qui est le livre... Attends, je te donne une seconde. Bien. Le livre qui est une prothèse qui est aussi ce qui va servir à Hermès à écrire la loi. Right law. No? Chez les Grecs, Prométhée et Bimédée sont des dieux qui appartiennent à l'époque tragique de la Grèce, c'est-à-dire à une époque où les Grecs ne croit pas à l'immortalité de l'âme. Chez les Grecs tragiques, il n'y a pas d'immortalité de l'âme. Il y a une conception de l'âme telle qu'elle erre en tant qu'esprit dans le royaume des morts, mais elle n'est pas immortelle. Ça, c'est très important. Ce que je veux dire, c'est que la pensée de Prométhée et d'Épiméthée est une pensée très chrétienne, avant le christianisme et avant le platonisme. C'est Platon qui va introduire l'idée d'immortalité de l'âme, ce qui va préparer aussi la réappropriation par saint Paul de la pensée grecque. Mais avant Platon, on ne pense pas du tout en Grèce que l'âme est immortelle. On pense que l'âme 
où l'homme, où le, où le, où la, la, ce qu'on appellera après la conscience, ou l'ego, mais disons, le mortel, est mortel. Ça veut dire quoi qu'il est mortel Ça veut dire qu'il est voué à anticiper sa propre mort, sa propre fin. L'homme est sans cesse inquiet, il est dans l'inquiétude perpétuelle de sa fin. Ce que Heidegger appelle « Angst » l'angoisse de la mort. We are always in the obsession of death and so we always say we must uh, take anything to eat. The wood, nous devons cueillir, ramasser, stocker et finalement construire, bâtir des maisons, etc sans arrêt en train de nous agiter. Ce mythe de Prométhée et d'Épiméthée raconte cette inquiétude fondamentale pour un être qui est foncièrement mortel, c'est-à-dire pour lequel il n'y a aucune possibilité de sortir de la mort, mais qui, par contre, a en charge son propre destin, Geshik. Ça veut dire que le mythe de Prométhée et d'Épiméthée raconte dans une version pré-métaphysique avant la métaphysique de Platon, l'articulation entre Getschik, le Getschik, le time, le temps, et techniques. You know? Parce que la question est indissociablement celle de la mémoire, de l'oubli, et puis mettez, ah, j'ai oublié. Cette problématisation de la technique comme mémoire, comme temps, comme oubli et comme destin, eh bien, c'est ce qui, chez Protagoras, qui s'appuie sur Eschyle et sur Sophocle, enfin, sur Hésiode, c'est ce qui ouvre la question de la politique. OK. So, what do you guys think of that? Has anyone uh, here read uh, Techniques in Time by uh, Bernard Stiegler? No. So Bernard Stiegler, the person who was talking in that video is, um, sorry, was a, a French philosopher um, who passed away about a year ago. Um, he was a student of uh, Jacques Derrida's, if you've heard of Derrida. Um, and he wrote quite a few different texts um, and Techniques in Time uh, is, is probably the, the text he's, he's known, um, known best for, um, which, which is, I don't know, I think it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice text that introduces ways of thinking about technology in a very originary way. Um, and this is a, a quote that kind of expresses that. So technologies are not external to our being, rather than are what makes us human as we are realized as technical beings, forever constituted by and constituting technology. This means that as we create technologies, we are also recreating the sort of humans that we are or will become. This isn't some kind of dysphoric look at technology. It doesn't mean that we're doomed um, by technologies by any sense, but this means rather that When we introduce te new technologies into our society, when we imagine future technologies, these are actually very profound questions because we're reconstituting the kind of people that we are or the kind of people that will become. Okay. Techniques constitute our own moral consciousness as they constitute intersubjectivity historicity, temporality, purpose, meaning, and freedom as constitutive elements. 
I don't want to get too much into this, but I introduced this, this notion last class, the idea about moral experience as a subjective experience, uh, meaning it's constituted by my subjective grasping of the world, and hermeneutic meaning it's sense making. One thing I find really interesting, and I, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this as well, is when I um, you know, watch my favorite TV shows on Netflix or Prime, um, or you know, anticipate you know, the new Matrix coming to the movie theaters, um, whenever we see these new constructions of machine consciousness, um, most commonly they seem to be made in our image, right? Meaning, we imagine some future human race that has almost a human subjective grasping of the world, right? Um, which makes it convenient, right? Because then we can relate to a machine morality as either aligning with our own or differing from our own. We can put ourselves in opposition or alignment with it. Does that make sense? I remember that after that last talk, rever reveries, you know, the from Westworld and the idea of transformative. But another way of thinking about technology and moral experience is not to think about technology as necessarily having a subjectivity that resembles our own but rather our own subjective grasp of the world as conditioned by technology, as therefore one that is constantly changing, right? So this is a question I'd ask you all to think about for a moment, and then we can have some discussion on. What technologies do you regard as most significant in shaping influencing, changing, extending, or otherwise reconstructing our moral consciousness. Okay. This image that I showed you previously, I think I used it last year, I don't remember now. Um, this is an image of the, the legislature from the summer of Pokemon Go, right? When everyone was out in the fields catching Pokemon. And you can see how this is it a, was it a child game? Was, would you call this a game for all ages? I don't know. But it changed the way that people interacted with one another. We're interacting with the world around them. And one can wonder what kind of being in the world did it actually create, right? Um, there's this nice article in The Atlantic, which I think puts the list of either 50 or 100 of the most significant technologies um, for our, like our Anthropocene, you know, our human age, um, how the world has changed since humans have become a part of it. Um, it. It's worth reading and thinking about, you know, what are the technologies that have changed the way in which we relate to one another and the world? Um, so thoughts from the group. Are there any technologies that, that you feel um, or that you would argue as most significant of affecting our, our relationship or understanding of one another. Samanti, sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name. Oh, it's okay. It's Samadhi. Samadhi, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Uh, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It takes time. Um, I think uh, one thing that I, a technology that I would consider uh, to be very influential is, I'm not sure, in the internet, does that, is that considered a technology? I guess, um, mostly because like before it, it was like we got news from like the other side of the world. Yeah, but not at like a fast enough rate. Well, maybe it's too fast now, but like it, it was in a way that made it seem like an other, like, oh, these are just people and they're not a part of us because we're in our own country. And I wouldn't say that that has been resolved by the internet, but I would say that it has like been brought to like in question. So like people are more willing to be empathetic because they are aware that, oh, uh, people over there are in a drought. Ah, like, uh, yeah, yeah. 
internet. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Um, other people's thoughts about her, her, her idea of the internet. Does the internet express a, a consciousness of, of the world? Can we speak of the internet of having some kind of grasping of the world around it? One that's fund fundamentally both human as well as technological? I think that the internet had a really big role in kind of shaping or in changing our kind of societal expectations as to how we interact with each other. And just the expectation that like you get a text, you reply immediately versus, okay, I'll send a letter, I'll respond in two weeks. And I think that like, along with other technologies, they all kind of almost aim at the same thing, I feel, where it's just like to like speed things up, make things more convenient. And it's just, I feel the internet had a big aspect on not like our economical lives or agricultural lives, it was just like our social lives and our interactions with one another. People talk about uh, technologies often having um, almost like a double or a twofold aspect to them, where on the one hand, things like the internet, they make things distant very near, but on the other hand, they can make things very near seem very distant, right? Um, and the word, oh, I'm trying to remember it, is almost this technology, technological entropy or an entropy where we essentially dissolve into this common disorder where we no longer experience nearness or distance. We just experience everything at this technological closeness. Um, Matthew, you had your hand up for a while. Uh, yeah, I guess mine was a, a slightly different technology that first came to my mind um, that I thought was very kind of polarizing and, and kind of how it shapes, I guess, what we thought are, uh, you know, what are, I guess, what we're kind of capable of, of achieving with that, and that's nuclear fission. Um, just because on one end you have potentially unlimited clean energy, but then at the other end you have the mutually assured destruction and, uh, you know, the end of the world as it is. So um, that was the, the one that came to my mind. Thanks, Matthew. Others thought about nuclear fission. I see something in the chat box. Okay, that's another idea. Okay, nuclear fission as, as a technology that changes the way that we look at the world because we realize so much of the world we don't even see, right? Yeah, the, the power that is in, you know, this infinitesimal small world that energy that can be released from. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to expand on your idea a little bit. Um, but I think that's, that's a great point, Matthew. I remember that made the list in the Atlantic was nuclear fission. Okay. Yeah, I just think it's interesting in the way that, I mean, you know, if we think of technologies as being neutral or if some technologies are inherently good or inherently bad, but then when there's something like nuclear fission where, you know, at one end of the spectrum, there's immense positive, and then at the other end of the spectrum, there's immense negative. And then it kind of places the, the burden of responsibility on us and how we choose to use it. Yeah. Uh, Sean, you have your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> so I have kind of two points to hit on. The first one, I think agriculture was a huge technological innovation just because eliminating the constant fight for survival sort of allowed our moral consciousness to explore things like culture and develop culture further. And as humanity progressed, you would have communities that formed and would develop their own unique cultures. And this idea of culture would go on and on and on. And then to connect with the internet, what I think the internet has done is it's given the individual and our individual experience of consciousness much more opportunity to explore broader points of view and to see content from other cultures and their way of viewing existence. And we can then use that in our own understanding of consciousness. Thanks, Sean. It's, it's funny, often those simple technologies, I mean, agriculture is a great example. I mean, one could also talk about, you know, refrigeration and the capacity to actually store food for prolonged periods of time or preservatives. Um, because there's no longer an intimacy of needing to be by the land, right? Or being by some other resource in which to survive. Um, 
but of course there's different dimensions i mean it's not necessarily always a positive thing right as people can become estranged from where they where they live uh, and start to see the land as a commodity as well and then aspen i saw you put in the chat box artificial intelligence machine learning uh, bci and, and various neurotechnologies those are all good examples have a question in the room here okay all right comment um i was gonna say on the topic of you thinking of the land as a commodity um technology has expanded our understanding of like the universe and like the solar system and just the planet as uh as a I don't even know what to call it as a as a commodity I guess um and at first we started to understand how the earth has limited resources and how it's being damaged by our actions um and so we had more initiatives to like do less harm to the earth but then on the flip side technological advancements have also caused us to start looking at other planets to exploit or plunder for resources in the way that we already have to the earth so there's um, a lot of moral ambiguity of like what's right and what's wrong mm -hmm. relating to the bigger world as a whole. Yes. Thanks for that example. So one question I'd like to ask. Um, so can we regard contemporary social media so those virtual spaces where code meets conversations as expressing a te technical exteriorization, formative of identity, uh, formation on an individual and collective group level. Um, gosh, I framed that question the most awkward way possible in the middle of last <laughs> a couple of nights ago. But I guess my fundamental question is, you know, when we talk about this notion of a singularity as something that you know, uh, Kim spoke in his opening lecture of, of when we're going to see a singularity. Um, is it possible that a singularity is already here? Particularly if we recognize that the current uh, various media uh, technologies that we utilize that we're in enmeshed within um, are already uh, expanding at exponential rates. Um, are already formative of a new way of grasping the world, which is quite different from what was before. So thoughts about that question? It's so poorly worded. I'll just leave it there and maybe someone can reformulate it in a better way later on. Another point I wanted to leave you with is that many moral perspectives can be codified into technologies such that designers, engineers have moral ethical responsibilities. And this is a very classic example. So it's, I think it's one of those examples you almost have to, to show in a class like this. And this is a Langdon Winner's Bridge. Um, and so Langdon Winner is another philosopher of technology, and he wrote about these bridges that apparently the architect Robert Moses designed and built um, in the United States. And these bridges were constructed over the parkways that went down to the beaches. And the perspective was um, that he had is that these technologies expressed morality, because essentially what they did is they made made it, uh, they made the beaches inaccessible to those individuals um, who relied on public transportation in order to get down to the beach. So these technologies in and of themselves were, were viewed to be so-called wrong, right? So they're an example of a technology as expressing a, a morality that the beach should only be for people of, of a certain social status. One attractive um, theory for starting to look at how different technologies relate to one another is actor network theory. So this is the work of Bruno Latour. And this basically regards that humans and technologies are enmeshed or bound up together in networks of socio-technical collectives. Um, 
Bruno Latour doesn't necessarily differentiate between the agent of humans and technologies, but rather there are both human and, and non-human actors enrolled in these networks together. And as part of this theory or way of looking at technolo technological human relationships, there's different kind of terms that, um, that he's developed and explored to essentially talk about the, the roles in these interactions and how both humans together with technologies can enact certain agenda or programs of action. And this is one of his classic example, examples, uh, the sleeping policeman, where essentially humans have delegated the task of policemen, which would have been to you know, watch the roadways and make sure that people don't speed and playground zones and other areas where one has to be mindful. Um, to speed bumps, right? And the speed bumps are essentially the sleeping policemen and they enact a particular program. And again, this is not a neutral technology, but rather one that somehow embodies a certain morality, a, a way of looking at the world as far as what is good or what is bad. And clearly what is good is to not speed around, you know, young children or, or individuals that otherwise could fall the victim of a, a car. Um, I showed this example last year as well. These are example of different uh, benches um, from different parts of the world. And they could also be accused or are touted to express a particular morality, right? So you can see the public bench in Tokyo or in New York or Montreal, all of them, um, the way that they're designed, they basically are, are forcing the person to sit upright. So these benches um, are conveying an appropriate way, a morally appropriate way of using them. And public benches should be for sitting down on. They shouldn't be for people who may lack a home and who wanna lie down and sleep. And I liked the uh, bench from near my house, which uh, is an Edmonton bench, right? Where you can sleep on. And then I showed you this uh, bench that um, came up when the COVID uh, pandemic started, which can be accused of expressing a different morality, right? Where essentially the, the owners of the establishments downtown were trying to prevent people from loitering around or gathering in groups. Um, so they put spikes on the benches. So made it hard for, for people who previously relied on them to, to sit or to sleep or, or whatever. To, to use them. And this raises other fundamental moral ethical questions. So what does our use and design of technologies say about us? And that could be asked of any of these kinds of technologies. So um, kind of the last point I wanted to bring across, and I don't think I have many slides, on, I don't have any slides particularly on this, is that this activity of reflecting on technologies, whether we're talking about post phenomenology or actor network theory, looking at technologies as kind of constitutive of our, of our being, um, there is value in it. Why? Because we can begin to reflect on where do we as humans want to see ourselves? Um, what do we consider as a good life now and in the future? And we realize that actually designers and others who are building these technologies um, have a considerable influence on how our society evolves over time. So I think uh, it was three o'clock yet. So I wanted to just leave time at the end for any kind of questions or discussions people had about this topic. So, you know, the syllabus for the course uh, gives directions to my office and that sort of thing. But there's something it doesn't mention, which is kind of cool, that Edmonton had an outdoor buddy bench program. At the same time that we were recruiting new faculty like MAD, but had no funding to renovate offices. So we had, we were recruiting people to these very high level positions and putting them in closets, little tiny rooms. And I, I, I thought that 
put, having the first Edmonton indoor buddy bench and to put it in our hallway where these new faculty so happy with the new position here and then finding out how cramped the office space was that they needed another place. And if you visit our part of the hospital, the fifth floor 5B4, uh, you'll see it. it's like the most prominent thing there. It is very natural. It, it was previously owned this bench um, by an old lady in Sherwood Park who had a cat and the cat put scratches in the exact center of, of, of the wood of the bench and it contains a you know, compartment and, and so on. And it's kind of a living thing. People bring stuffed animals and so on as the spirit moves them. And you don't know who these stuffed animals are from. You know, there are like over a hundred of us using that hallway. So it could be anybody. And it has continued during the, the uh, pandemic. The um, objects on the bench are a little bit more sanitizable and, and safe to handle than, than they would have been pre pandemic, but you can also, knowing something about this course and coming up to that hallway, you'll find so many things that would remind you of me and this course and, you know, sort of metaphors from the course, the schedule of the course, the bios of the people teaching in the course are on the wall of that same hallway. So when you talked about benches, <laughs> you really hit a resonant chord. And that uh, buddy bench has been up there now since uh, 2017. It was officially discussed as, at a faculty meeting. <laughs> so, yeah, and that, it's uh, minuted and, and everything. And it, it looks like something that, that wouldn't be allowed, but has been up there uh, for quite a few years now. So I and guess if, if people wanted to learn about Kim or learn about his faculty and the kind of moral values or things that are important to them, they can study the artifacts of, of, yeah. of their culture, including their bench, right? Which is a nice example of, of just showing, I mean, often how, if we want to learn about a peoples, then we, we study their technologies. Sure. And I've, I've been here 34 years. And so I, I came as chair in 1987. And there are pictures of the chairs in that hall hallway. And for the longest time, I could look out the window of my office and see the picture of what I looked like in 1987. Uh, yeah, and so there, there's a uh, really rich history. You may know that there was plan for Hub Lab that would bring all the laboratory physicians together and uh, the, the new uh, provincial government canceled that plan, e even though we'd already started to build and started to dig the hole <laughs> sort of thing for Hub Lab. Hub Lab would have completely eliminated these Kim Solis specific things, I think. And so the reason we have such rich history and you know the buddy bench that survived is that the government canceled uh, Hub Lab. So yeah. Matthew, you've had your hand up for a bit. Hey, uh, yeah, I was just kind of interested, of, I guess what came to my mind was just the uh, lasting impact of these different technologies and how they still affect our morality and and our society as a whole. Um, like I know you talked about the bridges by Robert Moses and and what I find is pretty interesting. I mean, it's tragic, but you know, as in addition to blocking access to you know the beaches of more affluent areas, it also blocked access to more. Uh, uh, metropolitan areas where you know there's greater densities of hospitals and healthcare centers and 
and you know those bridges are still you know they still exist and they're still blocking access from people in lower socioeconomic communities into more into you know receiving uh higher levels of care um so i think you know that's just interesting how as a society we've moved towards kind of removing these more systemic or at least i'd like to think so like systemic um barriers to healthcare especially but you know we have these physical barriers that still remain um and like just permeate through our history just as a, a parallel to that, Matthew, when we were working um, on things like the Alberta triage protocol um, for COVID-19 and a lot of the discussion that's gone around it after, the triage protocol is a technology, right? That's how it can be regarded. And one of the lenses in which it needs to be read is an equity lens, right? So how does the protocol potentially advantage or disadvantage members of society in accessing healthcare resources? So how is it uh, a modern day um, Robert Moses Bridge? Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, we're, I, I'd love to say that we've moved past the point of, of building such bridges, but uh, they sometimes take different forms as well. So, you know, one thing that is a striking, I think somewhat new development in 2021 you, you may say that this really isn't the case, but it, there are a lot of companies that are basically taken over by uh, machines already and it's, and it's working fine. So let's take an, an example that I've come to know very well. Um, you, you, you may have heard the story that, that on, uh, certain day in May, I uh, submitted a proposal for a course on academia.edu and, and they accepted it within two hours, but I, I didn't check my mail until the next day. So I didn't realize they, they, they had accepted it for you know, a couple of weeks, which was good because I really didn't have time to work, work on it right away. But there are only two people in charge. It's, it's a big program, but there are only two human beings running it. But the algorithms are very good. So you don't really have to talk to a human to figure out what to do next. And that's not the only example. You, you may say, well, how am I supposed to do this? You know, And it becomes obvious when you upload one thing, what you're supposed to do next. and, and so on, and in a sense, it's very equitable. Those two humans might have biases. I'm sure the the algorithms also have biases, but for some things, they're absolutely agnostic. You know, they 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 treat everybody the same. And dealing with the uh, internet service providers, I had a recent encounter with Telus where it was quite clear that, that what finally happened and what happened in the beginning, middle and the end of the story it was all what the, what the al algorithms do, the way the modems work, the way the network works. There was a giant power outage in uh, Edmonton on, on um, August 4th, and that played an important part, part of the story. The whole thing can be explained without any human action at all as, as what happened and you know our our internet service is now as of uh, 36 hours ago completely back to normal and it, it was also all sort of played out as the action of machines and algorithms and kind of turned out fine it took a long time when, but one, yeah. one way to think about some some of the, um, those technologies is is I don't know if in, in any of the other lectures people talk about like uh, Marshall McLuhan and his tetradic analyses of technologies, right? Yep. Uh, and looking at how technologies may reverse into something else. So how customer service can actually reverse into self-service, mm -hmm. right? With some of these new algorithms for, um, you know, getting help on, I don't know, UPS or any kind of website where you have a bot essentially you ask questions of and, and it guides you yeah. through. 
But you know, unfortunately, some of those technologies in, invariably do privilege individuals who um, have a very clear voice, right? If you try and phone your credit card company and your, your speech is garbled as a consequence of, I don't know, disability, for example, it can be very challenging to, to use those um, customer service mechanisms, right? Because yes. they actually do inadvertently uh, discriminate on based on people's ability to access the platform. Right, but let me just say something that I think all of you listening will say, no, that's, that's wrong. You know, but in many circumstances where you haven't reached a human yet, you, you, you have this yearning <laughs> to talk to a human. But when you do reach a human, you reach somebody who's completely redundant because they are going to answer the question using the same company algorithms that you would in, encounter if you don't use customer service with, with a with a real human. And those algorithms determine what happens. And so really they're, they're just passing on to you in words from a human, what you could already tell by just doing stuff with the other part of the system that doesn't involve humans. So yeah, I think the status of customer service is gonna keep going down for that reason that it's not just it's not that machines are currently smarter than we are but within companies that have all these algorithmic rules it really doesn't matter what the human says or thinks you know it's those rules that really govern what happens and it's quicker if you just deal with the you know machine part of the company so there are many examples of that now you might think you know, the university or the hospital are excluded. They're different. There you need people. But no, I, I can give you dramatic examples where the same thing happens in, in, in you know, the or organizations that Michael and I know very well. Yeah. Uh, Samadhi, you had your hand up. Um, hi. Um, so I guess oh, well, what, Kim, what Kim was saying was also very interesting. So I also want to comment on that. And then I had another point after. Um, like, I agree that like, um, I think, what is it? You have this customer service that is being translated into code and being processed that way. And it's really efficient and effective, right? I think I would like to see how um, later on, like AI can help with that. Because as I think we've discussed already, like the one thing that AI is struggling with a little bit is like conversation, nuance, jokes, understanding like human speech and things like that. And I think a lot of the problems that come with people speaking other than like accents, which needs to be integrated anyway, um, but like culture, interpreting culture, I feel like I, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how like um technology tackles that i guess oh it's really cool but yeah um another thing that i wanted to say was um it's again kind of with like the bench design and like just design in general of like urban spaces and technology um uh and again also that video that you showed about prometheus Pro yes okay cool yeah <laughs> um like um, I come from a country, uh, it's Sri Lanka, and when I lived there about 10 years ago, um, it was very interesting walking down the streets. I would see people like there were vendors, right? And there were like fish markets and you could walk to the beach and there was like a railway and it was very accessible. But then now if you go there, if you look at the streets, even in Google Maps, you'll see that a lot of it has been cleaned up. Um, so I understand that like it's like in the... in in the message of like uh, wanting to be more hygienic and wanting to like uh, have a cleaner society. But I look also at the fact that um, these markets have now been shut down, right? So people's livelihoods have been shut down and a large uh, portion of the population lives in poverty, right? So these people are pushed away because of this want to pursue technology and the advancements in technology and build better roadways and like all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but in reality, the roads are now made for people who can afford cars and less for people who can who can't afford them and need public transit and need those local roadside businesses. So I think it's very, it's very, uh, the reason why I brought it up is because it made me think that the video you showed made me think about that, about like the fire and how having that fire is very interesting because whoever holds it is the one that gets to direct what they want. Yeah, thank you. I will go now. <laughs> Thanks, Maddie. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, I had one also pertaining to the bridge concept. Um, has everybody heard of wildlife overpasses? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's really interesting because first we wanted to connect humans and make it easier for humans to travel. So we build these um, roadways and et cetera that fragment the land. And when the land is fragmented, then animals won't, usually a lot of animals won't cross over these types of barriers like roadways and stuff. Um, so the, the area of the land that they're able to access becomes more and more limited and more and more fragmented as we add in more of these structures. So then, especially in like natural parks and stuff, they started making these overpasses, which are like bridges for the animals to like cross over the road for, without actually going on the road. Um, so we're trying to like remedy some of the problems we've created. Um, but the problem with these overpasses is that they're very, um, if animals are trying to cross over them, then the, those animals are very concentrated. And so predators have learned to, you, to wait by those overpasses and wait for an animal to cross and then, you know, pounce on them from hiding. Um, so it hasn't, really like we we made a problem then we tried to fix it but it just makes another problem um so where was i going something about oh yeah morality is changing like how we view different um the different other organisms who are on the earth and what we what obligations we have to them yeah, <laughs> yeah but i one of the one of the things to, um, just to add to that is uh, a basic principle of technology design is technology design is also redesign. So anytime one designs something and puts it into a system, there are often untowards effects that the designer didn't anticipate. Um, and that's precisely why design necessitates more design or technology implementation tends to necessitate further technological implement implementation. So that's where the field of evidence-based design comes from, which is recognizing we're never going to get it right when we design something, but rather we have to study the impacts of what's designed and then redesign. Sorry, Kim, I think I cut you off. Yeah, no, no, that, that's fine. There's, there's a new 2020 book called Humankind, A Hopeful History. And what, it, what it's really talking about, there is something that I, I've been thinking about a great deal. It, with respect to what happens to us, right? When machines are really smarter than we, we are, will they still value us enough to accommodate us, to you know, create good uh, conditions for us? And that depends upon some demonstration of something we all believe in, but never talk about, the basic goodness of human beings, you know, that, that this is something we kind of think is, is there. But if you accidentally listen to a newscast, those of you who never plan to listen to a newscast, if you accidentally hear one, it never contains any evidence on the favorable side of there being basic goodness of human beings, and usually a lot of evidence on the other side. So yeah, ultimately that's that's going to be important. But that humankind book talks about instances where, for instance, if you think back to the Lord of the Flies, you know, of real life situations where small groups are stuck in, on an island and they actually treat each other honorably and everything goes fine. So there, there, there are instances where it seems like this evidence for the basic goodness of human beings naturally comes out. And isn't 
morality and moral reasoning and everything more important and consequential if basically humans are good or could be good, you know? If, 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 if that's a failed enterprise from the start, then most of our lectures should be about something else, Michael, right? <laughs> It's just a side issue. It's going nowhere. Whereas if this basic goodness of human beings is a real thing, then this is, you know, the most important lecture in the course. So, yeah. I'd love to say it's the most important lecture in the course, but unfortunately, uh, I, I won't go there. Uh, Sean, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I guess related to what Kim just said, when we think about how machines might um, treat us in the future. I think it's important to reflect on how our own societies treat each other right now. If we think about what role do, um, let's say, the underutilized people in society play within our society when we use technologies to antagonize people that don't have homes, for example. And as machines are coming in and replacing people in the workforce, there's the big question of what are those people going to do? And more broadly, what are humans going to do as machines replace us more efficiently? Uh, I feel like current systems aren't necessarily adapted to such a reality, but it's coming to us a lot faster than we expect. So I, I think the, the issue is very much a socio-cultural, economic, and political issue that as a whole, we have to consider more so than just the technological aspects of it because technology is going to evolve as technology is going to evolve. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're over our allotted 80 minutes, but yeah, are, are there other burning questions? Uh, I think this has been a very worthwhile session. Yeah. So, the, yeah, Michael? Well, I was just going to say, I, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. I really enjoyed the discussion. Yeah. And, and uh, there is no class on Thursday because of Truth and Re Reconciliation Day. So we will meet again a week from today and talk about regenerative medicine. <laughs> so, so anyway, thank, thank you all very much. Yeah.